To save his sister, David's gonna have to dive in and face his deepest traumas. But what if those traumas don't want to be seen? It's the FX original series, Legion. Chapter 3. Hey everyone, D here, and welcome to this week's review of Legion. So, of course, we are entering spoiler territory. This is your warning. All right, so this week's episode, we are sort of diving deep into David's training, as the repeated mantra of the eye is saying to a tortured Amy, poor Amy, what's with the leeches on the face? That's just creepy. Uh, but his repeated mantra at the beginning of the episode, shall we begin? quite apropos for this episode because now we of course we have David having a reason to dive back into training to face those traumas. Amy is in danger and he's got to do what he can to help her out. So nothing like a little family stress in order to motivate one to uh, face one's demons and there was definitely some demon facing going on today. Much of the episode really de delving into David's psyche and that's really where this show is at its strongest. I mean it has great characters, it has great story, it has great relationships, uh, but when we are diving into David's psyche, when, we're, when Tanami is taking us into those trips into David's memories, the storytelling really takes on a whole new level. A very visual, visceral, non-linear storytelling. We get to see things rolling over each other, images overlaid on top of it. It really makes for a very deep storytelling. It's certainly not always very clear, but it's one of those that as you go back and start to rewatch things, you keep seeing all the little images, all of the little hints that are dropped constantly throughout in a lot of these flashbacks and a lot of, again, this layered imagery which really is going to make this show so much more impactful even on second viewings. I've had to watch uh, the first few episodes a couple of times and you really do start to see new and interesting things in there. So a lot of great stuff storytelling wise uh, diving in and we're seeing sort of how David's memories are, are playing out. Uh, Tommy hits a really interesting point when they go back in to the break-in of, uh, of David's psychiatrist's office and you start to see Memories. As he's there, he is seeing memories within his memories. Uh, and I think it's these type of layered things that are going to start really bringing things out. These are the onions that we're going to be peeling away on top of things. And finding out, most likely, is that a lot of these memories are either artificial memories put into place to protect us from what else has happened before, or constantly tweaked. We're being pushed away. Whenever we get into these sort of traumatic areas, this is when David's psyche, or what appears to be David's psyche, starts to fight back. Of course, part of the core that's pushing and really supporting David on this journey is his relationship with Sydney, and this just continues to develop through this episode uh, also. It's, it, you know, it's really nice to see those little quiet moments throughout everything that they're going through and, and, and the adventures and the, the, the mind digging in. Those quiet moments between the two of them is sort of David's resting in between sessions and you get to have Sydney and him have their little interactions. It's always really cute. I mean, that, that scene when he's out on the pier and he is sort of revealing to her what he is missing about not being her the long hair, the shifting of, uh, of, of body weight, of center of gravity, which I think is, was just brilliant because men's center of gravity is a little bit higher, women's center of gravity a little bit lower. So there is a difference there. Um, and then, of course, the, the more, you know, cutesy, you know, touching the breasts and having to go to the bathroom, which was all really funny. And I loved her response back to that of like, oh, yeah, well, I had to. I mean, just kidding. But it was... Those little playful moments, I think, are nice, and, and it, it dives into a lot more, again, of these identity issues, specifically when Sid says that she has been, you know, a, a Chinese man and a 300-pound woman and, and all of these different people of that she has gone into their bodies, and yet she is always her. That the body is, one, is, is sort of just the vehicle for the self. Um, and I think this is going to really sort of play in as David continues to delve in and, and pursue his psyche. 
um, and sort of get everything through there, you know, piece it all apart. Uh, but their connection is really, I think, what is going to allow further on that support system starts to meld the two. I mean, one, they have switched bodies, so they have that certain connection. But on top of that, their relationship is starting to allow the two of them to sort of blend and really work off of each other. Uh, one, when David kind of has that whole scene uh, in Carrie's little laboratory and ends up, what I believe, basically astral projecting into where Amy is and gets to see that whole scene from where she is, that he brings Sid with him, that it's not just something that he can do himself. He can start to take her with him, the two of them having that connection to be able to share those moments. Because later on, that really plays out and, and I think reveals itself when they go back in and we have the little boy, David, which oh, was so cute. And again, and then that, that moment right there is as the two of them have dealt so much with not being able to touch, even when he, they return back from the astral projection and he's worried they're in the water and she's half drowning. And the first thing she pops up is, I'm okay, don't touch me. Even in those traumatics, they can't touch. And yet in David's memory, her powers don't work. They can have that little physical connection. And the fact that it's the little boy, David, I thought, was just beautiful because it makes it, it removes any of that sexual component to it of just being able to touch and really focuses on just that strong emotional connection. The little boy and the little girl being able to embrace and just show support and love was, was just beautiful. Um, but while she is in there, when she gets to see the yellow-eyed demon, and Tonami and uh, Melanie don't, that is part of David's psyche, part of his interior that, that she is starting to see. And he did have his concerns about bringing her in. It was that little one push on their relationship. But when looked at it in and, and that, that second moment they had together, it makes sense. Diving into his psyche, he feels like he's done a lot of bad things. Uh, and doesn't want to reveal that to her, doesn't want her to think less of him. It's a standard protection technique, and, and that's great. Um, that he was able to do that and then move on on that moment. They were to have that connection, acknowledge it, and then was able to bring her in because having her in that mind is allowing her, because of the connection they have, to see what it is that he's going through. Uh, and I think ultimately, especially now that he is kind of trapped in his psyche, it's going to be that connection that's going to allow him to be pulled back out. All right, so as we're diving into David's psyche, there are really kind of two primary bits of imagery that we have to deal with. Uh, one is the super creepy kid from the ultra creepy child story, which you should never, ever read to your kids. There's something wrong with that. Uh, and then, of course, there is the yellow-eyed monster. Um, now, for the yellow-eyed monster, we don't really know who that is. This could be, as I've mentioned before, a manifestation of himself, of David himself, either as a level of anxiety or possibly his real dark side that's sort of hiding within there that he doesn't really want to face. Um, but the other possibility is, again, because this is an X-Men uh, mutant Marvel property, uh, I know we touched on the joke that it could be Mojo. I don't think that it's Mojo. That would just open up a whole new different realm of, of action and possibilities and characters. It just that opens up a giant can of worms right there. Um, but one of the characters that it could be is a character known as the Shadow King. Uh, he was first debuted in X-Men 117, if I remember correctly. Uh, he is a super power te powerful telepath, evil telepath. He's, he's one of the first major like evil mutants that Charles Xavier runs into and after dealing with him uh, sort of motivates him to start the X-Men to realize that there are evil mutants out there and he needs good mutants in order to 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 battle them. Um, uh, Shadow King is a telepath, a super powerful telepath and he's kind of he's kind of like uh, an astral creature. He's been around either for a really long time or he was a super powerful telepath that uh, sort of once his body died was able to live on either through by possessing other people uh, or manifesting himself in the astral plane. Um, so anyway, this is another character looks very much, you know, darker character, but with those glowing yellow eyes, uh, very indicative of Shadow King. 
Uh, and because of the connection with Charles Xavier, because of the connection with the X-Men, that seems a pretty reasonable possibility. Uh, in which case, then we are dealing with a trans-dimensional creature, a telepath that could be preying on David, could have been preying on David, could be something that he is sensing in his psyche and is sort of messing with him, perhaps wants to possess him, become a new body for him to live in. Not, again, not entirely sure. We haven't seen enough in the show to really sort of figure that out. Um, but like I had mentioned, boy, I did find it quite interesting. One, when David was able to see him coming in without Melanie or Tonomy, and then of course, later on, when Sid is able to see him sort of start to burst through and chase through, um, and all that great chase, all that great sequence at the end there, just chasing through memories. The transitions they're able to do in this show are just phenomenal. And this is part of that nonlinear storytelling once they go into David's mind. They can move from a room to a new place in no logical sense, uh, moving through windows into new places. It was just, they, they do a lot of great jobs in with that. Um, even in that scene where you get to see the wall sort of breaking through and the arms sort of reaching out. I mean, there's just the, the imagery that they get to play with in this is phenomenal. Really gives that visceral horror feel to it while still we know we're just sort of messing with our psyches. Uh, but anyway, so that is just one, that, that is one possibility. It's, if it's someone else, the Shadow King is a pretty, pretty good possibility. A lot of similarities there. Otherwise, it could be just a shadowy side of David himself. Uh, and it sort of brings up that idea that he had mentioned to, uh, to Sid, which I think is interesting because we have the division and we have uh, Summerlin can, trying to convince David that you're not crazy, you're just a super powerful mutant. But what if he's a super powerful mutant who is also crazy? Now, the creepy story kid, I, I am feeling, is some manifestation of David's inner self. Whereas the yellow-eyed monster could possibly be another creature, another telepath. The kid, I think, is an actual part of himself because it has a connection to that storybook. Um, especially, he sort of runs into him in that little Halloween trip while chasing out his dog. I think that kid is sort of the a, a defense mechanism of... These are parts of the memories that we don't want to access. And the angry little boy is, is him. Did he lash out as a kid? Again, we, we know his father, we heard that his father died a couple of years ago while he was in the hospital. But is that the case? We don't really know what happened to his mom. Um, as his powers start to manifest, because he has so many, Tony asks him, what are you? I mean, he's not just a telepath. He's a telepath and a telekinetic and he can teleport, and he can astrally project. And these are just the first of the powers that we are starting to see. So when he is a young kid, as those start to manifest, what if they manifest in some horrible way? As, as kids as were growing up, we start to lash out as those, as those hormones come in and those emotions start to change. What if the first manifestation is out of something of anger, of fear, uh, of sort of response? And all of these creepy bad kids who don't want to go to sleep there's a reason why either the nightmares that he's having or that he is telepathically reacting in his sleep and thus doing damage around his house there was the comment that uh, division three had said to amy is when you were younger you thought you lived in a haunted house the boy would move th you know you put him in the bathroom and then he'd be wandering outside things would move around the house what if in one of those sleepy moments he did something really bad and is therefore now blaming himself. Could be another reason why he didn't want Sid to come in also. All right, just a couple of small things. Uh, one, okay, so it appears that Lenny was David's little uh, uh, drug buddy right there, that she did exa uh, exist in that time uh, from we can see from back in the memory. So I know I wasn't quite entirely sure. There's still something weird about Lenny being his buddy outside of uh, on the streets and in the hospital. Um, but that did seem to be the case, so good to know that. I found it funny that the division in trying to find David is convincing his sister that he's not actually crazy, but that he's a telepathic mutant. I just... 
I just find that to be a real interesting choice. It's not that, yeah, your crazy brother's loose, we need to find him. It's, no, your brother isn't crazy, he's a super powerful telepath, and thus we need to find him. Just an interesting approach. In the end there, when Melanie was still traipsing around inside of David's mind and saw the images of his parents, and his parents looked back at her, okay, that's creepy. Memories aren't supposed to be able to interact, but as Sid says later on, I don't think these are just memories, which is why, again, I'm thinking about the uh, Shadow King idea there. All right, Carrie the Tech has a girl Carrie living inside of him. Sister, relative, something like that. I don't know. Fun to see all of those, uh, especially his defense of the lab. Promise me you're not going to destroy anything. David's like, I can't promise that. I just, I don't know. I love that moment. And finally, uh, just a little uh, art comment. Uh, the coffee maker in the beginning. I love that. That was beautiful. The little track that the cups came down to fill up. There's almost a steampunk feel to it, sort of a blend of ancient and modern technologies. Uh, and the voice there, of course, was Melanie's uh, dead husband, I believe, um, who helped sort of start the whole Summerland area, uh, telling the parable about the crane. Uh, the moral of that seeming to be is don't look behind the curtain, which is interesting considering that that's sort of what they're doing with David. They're peeking behind the curtain to see what inside of him that actually makes him tick. In the parable of the crane, of course, once they look behind, the crane flies away and they don't get what they're able to get. So hopefully that is not uh, the conclusion that we're going to run in, into this journey in David's psyche that once we sort of reveal the truth um, that he is just going to disappear. But that could also mean that he has a right to have some happiness, too. So that would be a good note. All right, so I think that's going to wrap things up for this week. Uh, now going into next week, David is trapped in his own psyche. They're going to have to dive in and try and pull him out. What is he going to find? What is he going to reveal in there? And is Lenny going to be any actual help, or is she just going to sit there and keep poking at him? Come on, Lenny, help us out. We know that you're dead, but you can still be helpful. Um, anyway, so that is going to be next week. Uh, now, there's eight episodes total in this, uh, in this show, so we are almost at the halfway mark. But so much is happening at each episode, so I can't even begin to predict where we're going to end up going with this. So very excited with what's to come. So if you did enjoy this review, please go ahead and hit that like button. Comments, thoughts, ideas, random speculation. Throw those down in the comment section below. Let me know what you think. Let me know what you're thinking about this series and where you think everything is going to be going. Uh, you can always catch me on Twitter and Instagram. I'm at Darren Jakes. Uh, but don't miss any of these reviews. We're not only doing Legion, but we're doing Black Sails and The Walking Dead. We just finished up the LMD arc of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. and that will be turning back just after this show ends in the beginning of April. So that's going to be really exciting. And you won't miss any of that if you are a subscriber. And you can do that by hitting my little face right here. That's the subscribe button. Hit that and you won't miss anything. And what I'll do is I'll throw up our latest review for Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. the big LMD finale right there. So I am D and I am out of here. I'll catch you guys next time. Bye-bye.